And now it is my great pleasure to introduce the chair for our first panel, Dr. Stephanie Curentin. Dr. Curentin is an associate professor at Boston University's Wheelock College and the director for the Center of Ecology of Early Childhood Development. She's also the founder of the RISER Network, which stands for Researchers Investigating Social Cultural Equity and Race, and it focuses on the impact of racism as a critical driver of health and education-related disparities in early childhood. Dr. Curentin is also on the Leadership Council for the Stanford Center on Early Childhood. We are so lucky to have her here today to lead this distinguished panel in a discussion on the crucial importance of addressing structural, racial, and economic inequalities in early childhood policies and programs. And once again, bios for all the panelists are in your programs. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. So I am so pleased to be here to open this conversation um, about a value component that is at the center of our new Stanford Center, racial equity and, social, and racial justice. I'm guessing that they thought I would be a good person to lead this conversation because the mission and expertise of my own center, the Center on the Ecology of Early Development, which we call SEED, is focused on racial justice. At SEED, we are explicit about our strengths-based focus on African-American children and families. And at SEED, we're also leading the field, the early childhood field, in how to reimagine classroom quality in a way that centers racial equity. Because we view it as though there, that there is no quality without equity. In fact, our hashtag at SEED is planting seeds of racial justice in Boston and beyond. So I am here today to plant seeds of justice and equity here at our new Stanford Center. So the title of our panel is The Imperative of Addressing Structural, Racial, and Economic Inequalities in Early Childhood Policy and Programs. And my esteemed colleagues, which I will introduce in a bit, on this panel will be talking today about inequalities of racism and classism that run rampant throughout our early childhood system. Due to historical legacies of slavery, forced removal from homelands, and discriminatory immigration policies, young children who are ethnic and are racial minorities experience higher poverty rates than their white counterparts. And these income disparities have implications for children and families' access to childcare and early education. And this is even more problematic because families of color are more likely to work lower wage jobs with non-standard hours in which they need access to flexible childcare options like home-based care as well as center care. So not only is there racism on the consumer side of childcare and early childhood education, there's also racism that affects the workforce that is providing this care. So for instance, there's a wage disparity between white and black providers across all childcare settings, and racism also rears its ugly head as linguistic chauvinism when we design early learning experiences that do not value and support a child's home language. And we are especially fortunate on our panel to have a speaker who currently serves, who currently wears the hat of a funder, but who very much comes from the hands-on world of childcare, specifically childcare regulation and compliance in New York City. And it is especially valuable to have both perspectives here on our panel because it provides diverse insight into what childcare and early um, care and education should be. So, even though we're here to talk about racism and classism in early education and childcare, I'm going to push my panelists to think about racism and classism as it expands beyond these early learning settings. Just like we know that all learning happens within an ecosystem, racism also happens within an ecosystem. And it hits all levels of that ecosystem. So I want to push us to think about the inequalities that affect communities of color overall. So specifically in terms of housing, environmental pollution, and community violence. 
And I say this because of personal experience I recently had with community violence myself and seeing children who were also experiencing this violence themselves. So I saw firsthand how community violence burns like a wildfire and it spreads through all areas of a community, even sacred places like schools and churches. So I urge us as scholar advocates, or what I like to call early childhood social justice warriors, <laughs> to, think about the, <laughs> to think about these structural inequalities beyond the early childhood system, and to also talk about how these inequalities in ECE overlapped with racism in housing and pollution and neighborhood violence. So, now that you have an idea of the framing for our panel, I would like to introduce our panel members. And so I am going to do an introduction and I will be joined here as I introduce folks by my panel members, okay? So we will start with Leah Austin. And so, Leah is um, the executive director of the Center for the Study of Child Care Employment at the University of California, Berkeley. She leads the center's um, agenda aimed at realizing a publicly funded early care and education system that secures racial, gender, and economic justice for the women whose labor is the linchpin of its services. She is an expert on the US early childhood education system and its workforce, and she has extensive expertise in the areas of compensation, preparation, working conditions, and racial equity. So, and then I'm gonna introduce, I will introduce everyone on our panel, and then they'll have five minutes to do opening remarks. Next, we're gonna introduce my colleague, um, Miriam Calderon, and, <laughs> And Miriam is the Chief Policy Officer of Zero to Three. She leads the development and implementation of the organization's policy agenda, their priorities, and, and their strategies. She oversees the Policy Center, which includes federal and state policy and advocacy, and serves as the principal spokesperson for the organization on public policy matters. Welcome, Miriam. And now we are, um, I will introduce Natalie Renew. And, and Natalie is the executive director of Homegrown, a national initiative focused on equitably, um, equitably including six million home-based childcare providers in our public early learning and care system. Throughout her career, Natalie has overseen the development of large programs, secured sustaining funding for major initiatives, and supported local systems change in the early learning sector. She holds a bachelor's degree in political science and a master's in public administration. So welcome to Natalie. And last but not least, I would like to introduce Calvin Chan, and Calvin is the managing director of the Robin Hood Foundation's Early Childhood Program, and there he's leading ambitious efforts to optimize birth outcomes, maternal health, and early childhood development to address poverty, racial inequity, and social injustice. He manages a portfolio that exceeds 166 million in special initiatives and core investments. He's a native New Yorker and a proud alumnus of Head Start. New, <laughs> New York City Public Schools and Brown, Harvard, Columbia, and Cambridge Universities. He is joyously raising three children, age five and under, and his wife Vicky in Brook with his wife Vicky in Brooklyn. And I would last but not least like to give a special shout out to my colleague, Calvin, as a former Head Start kid myself, <laughs> class of 78 and 79, and we are, we are two of the lucky ones who are um, able to be here today to um, serve our early childhood community that shaped us and who we are. So I'm gonna pass my mic over, and I'm gonna pass my mic to Leah, who will speak. Okay. Should I come I here, so. here, here, here? Oh, I think we, can, we have these mics, so you can sit. Okay, great. Okay, um, hello, everybody. Uh, thank you, Stephanie, um, and congratulations to Phil and the team here um, on the launch of, this, of the center. It's very exciting, and glad to have you as neighbors, and looking forward to working together. Um, I wanna just start my opening remarks by reminding us um, of who our early educators are. 
Um, as Stephanie said, they are the linchpin of early care and education services. There are our neighbors, there are community members, there are our sisters, our mothers, our daughters, our brothers as well. And they're a highly experienced workforce. More than half of our home-based providers and a third of child care center teachers have more than 16 years of experience doing this work. They're highly knowledgeable about their craft. In addition to their experience, about three quarters of our workforce have been to college, even though in most cases they're not required to. Among center-based staff, 30% have a bachelor's degree and another 18% have an associate's degree. Um, among our home-based providers, about 20% have a bachelor's degree or higher, and another 20% have an associate's degree. And Stephanie, as we enter into this conversation, I really appreciate you asking us to kind of push beyond thinking about only an ECE context and think more broadly about inequities and inequality in our communities and in our systems. And this is a really important reminder, I think, um, when we consider the misalignment between the labor that early educators provide and the conditions that are then provided to them, that it's not only about a response to ECE and what people are thinking about ECE, but in a context of how systems respond to black and indigenous people, to immigrants, to, um, and to women. And you know, that has a lot to do with how early care and education is organized and the resources that are provided or the lack of resources that are provided to our early educators. You know, everybody is talking about the value of early care and education these days in a way that we've never seen before. And I take some hope um, in the sense of urgency that uh, we're hearing in response to the pandemic and a new understanding people have about early care and education. At the same time, it is the reality that outside of emergency funds, which have been historic in response, but outside of emergency funds, we've still seen very little for our early care and education workforce. And so when I step back to reflect on, reflect on this, it's obvious to me that this has to do you know, with systemic racism and oppression. Like this is what systemic racism and oppression looks like when we look at the early care and education workforce and how they're treated. In 2014, when Marcy Whitebook and Deborah Phillips and Carolee Howes released Worthy Work Still Unlivable Wages, that documented how little wages had changed and actually lost ground in some cases since they first did the National Child Care Staffing Study 25 years prior. There were audible gasps that we people had when the wage and compensation data were presented. You know, we hear some of those today when we talk about racial wage gaps in the sector. But if close attention were paid, there really isn't any need for gasps of surprise, right? These are long-standing inequities. Joan talked about the enduring inequities. Um, we just launched at the center, led by Marcy Whitebook, uh, a project called Echoes, which is a his, uh, history and you know, looks at contemporary work as well. But as part of that, and, and I, would, I think there's something in the gallery walk later, um, you could get lost in this ECHOES project for hours. I encourage you to check it out. Um, but included in there are, is documentation um, of how dismissive people have been of dealing with compensation for, this, for the paid workforce for at least over 100 years, right? And we mustn't lose sight of the origins of paid childcare in the system, which are rooted in slavery, right, in the forced labor of black women to care for, the, for children, for white children. So racism and oppression have long been a part of le the legacy of early care and education, and it's reflected in our systems today. We see it in the racialized pay gaps. We see it in racialized opportunities. We consistently find in data sets that White women, for example, are overrepresented in leadership positions in the sector, and there remain spaces all across governing, decision-making, research, advocacy, um, where folks don't reflect our families and our workforce that don't look like our panel today, that um, still have too few people of color or no people of color at all involved. We see it in systems that reinforce oppression here in um, California, you know, we have a master plan on early care and education that has a statement about Black Lives Matter, but not a single specific recommendation to address the basic pay of this workforce without asking people to first do something else beyond their jobs. 
And we see it in entrenched policies all across this country, which too often reward inequitable distribution of resources, like many QRIS systems, and further isolate those who experience scarcity in the first place. So when we're called to consider, um, as this panel is asking us to do, the imperative of addressing structural racism and economic inequalities in our policy and programs, um, I would suggest that we have a lot of work to do, right? We're doing some of that work. We see it happening across our communities. But if we're going to have anti-racist policies and practices, people have to be anti-racist. People have to learn what that is, what it looks like, what it feels like, how to enact that so that we can make different choices um, and take different pathways in our current policies, not just our holdover policies, but as new policies are being enacted. And so I, I know our, many of our panelists are grappling with those things today, um, and I'm really looking forward to, to hearing how you all are doing that and taking us forward. Thank you. Thank you. So thank you so much for those opening remarks. We're going to turn it over to Natalie now, who will um, talk about some open thoughts to start us off. Thank you, Stephanie. Congratulations, Phil and Joan. I'm so honored to be here today. Um, I represent an organization called Homegrown. We're a funders collaborative that works alongside home-based childcare providers across the country to elevate and value the work that they do to support children, families, and communities. Um, Home-based childcare, I'm going to define it because it really includes a very diverse group of caregivers, some who operate licensed, regulated small businesses in their home, serving eight or ten children, sometimes with another staff person, and the vast majority that are grandmoms, aunts, uncles, and trusted neighbors that are caring for children in their community and helping their parents in the myriad of complex needs that they face. This is the most prevalent form of non-parental childcare in this country. There are over six million um, children under the age of five that are being cared for by about five million caregivers in their homes. This workforce where the broader early childhood workforce is about 40% providers of color, in home-based settings that number rises to about 50% of, of providers of color, very strongly um, representative of immigrants and dual language learners. And home-based providers are serving the most diverse group of children in our country. They are primarily serving babies and toddlers. They're serving black and Latin children, children who come from low-income households, and children whose parents work non-traditional and non-predictable hours schedules. Parents choose this care, not just because it works for them, but it's because they, well, that's what they want. This is where we see care that is embedded in intergenerational relationships, where there is deep attachment between the adults and children and the adults and adults that come together in home-based childcare. This is also the care that's available when all other care is not, late at night, on the weekends, and in places where it's not feasible to run and operate a childcare center. Um, for home-based childcare providers, there are really sort of two levels of discrimination and marginalization. There's this shared experience that they have with the early childhood workforce that Leah described, whereas in our society we don't value and we certainly don't compensate um, the early childhood workforce. But home-based childcare providers face additional marginalization within the early childhood sector. And these caregivers are often not recognized as a part of our early childhood sector. They're not able to get licensure and access critical resources. And in many cases, they face a situation that tells them they do not belong. The dominant frame in the early childhood sector is informed by what happens in schools and centers. This is where our formative research comes from. This is where our understanding of quality comes from. And that does not see, recognize, and value the incredible asset that these caregivers bring to children and families. And it really reinforces this narrative to them that you don't belong here. Um, I think there are many ways that we can kind of see the results of that, but the rapid survey has really shown us very clearly that our home-based providers are faring poorly in a sector where almost all caregivers and providers are faring poorly. These caregivers are experiencing significant hardship, 
They are, one in three is going hungry regularly. Um, they are carrying high amounts of debt and um, both medical and student debt and are really facing incredible hardship. Yet these are the caregivers that show up every day under the most difficult circumstances when everything else is locked down to care for children and families. So I, I will just kind of close out my remarks by saying I think there's an incredible opportunity and I'm excited um, about the commitment that Phil and his team have to really start to have this conversation around the strength, the asset, and the incredible commitment that home-based providers bring to our field, and to really um, situate that within a context of really addressing uh, systemic and decades-long inequities. Thank you so much for that, Natalie. You gave me chills. I'm so glad to have that voice here and present on our panel. We're gonna turn it over to Calvin will give his opening remarks. Sure. First of all, I'm so humbled to be here today as a Head Start grad. This, this context of being in a space as opulent and bright and promising as this was not necessarily on our horizons. Um, and so to that extent, I thank Yolanda and Ramona, my Head Start teachers, for that. <laughs> it, it was through that experience of Head Start that I learned English, that I was introduced to um, people outside of the Chinese immigrant community. And it was really a moment of learning and growing up as an American for me. So I say all this because as much as Head Start has been so key to the lives of a lot of children, it has to be recognized that the backdrop in which Head Start operates within is unto itself challenged by a set of childcare regulations that unto themselves express a silent structural racism within it. And I say this because if you just look simply at the ways in which childcare services are distributed throughout the five boroughs of New York City as a case in point, centers are disproportionately found in the whitest neighborhoods and therefore the wealthiest neighborhoods in New York City. Centers are often where Head Starts are also located. There's a tension there that's, that's not sensible in any way. Similarly, as it pertains to the distribution of home-based programs in New York, you will also find home-based programs being disproportionately located in neighborhoods with the highest poverty indices. That's a cipher for your black and brown neighborhoods. Home-based programs are not necessarily where Head Starts are found either. And they are also a sector where there are fewer expectations baked into the regulatory construct, which in turn reveals how important we look at the moral dimensions of regulatory contexts in early learning settings. They're not set out to create equity in the landscape as they are currently configured. And I can say this because one of my main projects when I was a government official was to think about the inequities therein for children served in centers housed in family shelters. They were considered exempt from childcare regulations because of their, of their shelter context. But that also meant that children were not entitled to spaces free of lead, services provided by individuals cleared of abuse registries. That is a very dark reality that a lot of children lived in, not to mention growing up in shelter as an adverse childhood experience seemed to be a non-issue in the face of that regulatory context. So I've worked very deeply um, in New York City as it relates to bringing equity in pathways that are often overlooked as opportunities for equity development. And I would strongly advocate for work on regulatory fronts as an important strategy to this production of equity and justice. Um, so that's my work in government. I'm also blessed with 
an extraordinary opportunity now in my role at Robin Hood to be instigating a lot of important catalytic work in the early childhood space in which early learning is but a slice of it. And all the presentations so far this morning indicate how multifactorial children's issues are. They are at once grown-up issues. They're at once child-specific issues. They're at once structural issues about our society. And so the ways in which we have approached the production of equity through our investments at Robin Hood relates exactly to this notion of how can we, using philanthropic dollars, catalyze systemic reforms? How can we look at all of these troubled, overlooked issues within systems as an opportunity for growth, if not awareness from the part of the government that let's say there are children being impacted in systems that traditionally focus on adults. Rikers Island is a case in point. There is a nursery there. It is falling apart. It is in shambles, literally. That as a place where someone calls home in the first year of their life is a non-issue because of the focus on the inmate, which unto itself is a dehumanizing enterprise. So what does that mean in, in terms of our work at, in philanthropy? For me, it really is a, a, an opportunity for us to go straight into these places where there are quite obviously children, but they're deprioritized. So thinking about a bright future for them is very much, fortunately for me, a day-to-day -day affair. And I am so pleased to be here to share that view with you. And we will have our last opening remarks from Miriam. Um, Stephanie, tonight. I'm gonna try to go fast because I know I wanna have more conversation, um, which means I'm gonna talk really fast. But I just wanna say I'm so honored to be um, a part of this effort at Stanford. And felicidades again to Joan um, and Phil for today. So um, I am the Chief Policy Officer at Zero to Three. Um, our mission is to ensure that all babies and toddlers have a strong start in life. Um, for us, of course, that means that there must be opportunities for their families um, and their caregivers. Um, that is obviously inextricably linked to how um, babies um, fare. Um, and we envision a society in which there is knowledge and will really to act and capitalize on what we know. And you know, we heard Phil talk about again today is the enormous um, potential um, explicitly of the first thousand days. Um, you know, to put sort of more into plain words, it's, it's about like building will, right? Is about um, helping people understand um, that, you know, they need to be concerned about other people's babies, not their own babies, right? It means um, understanding as a society that our liberation is inextricably entwined, right, with all babies and particularly the kind of society and country we have um, for babies and toddlers and their families. Um, we can't do this work at zero to three without an explicit understanding and frame of structural, racial, and income inequality um, and anti-racist policies, um, as uh, Leah pointed out. Um, you know, the data bear it out. More than half to almost, you know, almost 65% for black children of uh, Alaska Native, American Indian, black, and Latino children are born into families experiencing low income. We, this is racialized, right? And we know, and the structural frame bring, brings for us this understanding that this is by design. There are historical um, contexts, and you know, you, some folks have talked about it. We are bringing multi-generational trauma to this, and there is a, in, the, in its current form, it shows up in our systems as deep, persistent, interlocking, right, policies, laws, and systems that perpetuate those kinds of outcomes. What I'm talking about, that spans, I think, as Kelvin has talked about, child welfare, immigration policies, segregated communities, under-resourced schools. We can't envision this reality for babies and toddlers, the capitalizing on the enormous potential of the first thousand days, right, without this understanding and frame. So. You know, we, uh, it sounds simple to say practice as policies and advocacy work that is really designed around what babies need. Um, but the reality is, um, you know, we are, 
We are so far from that. Uh, Phil talked about the resources in K-12 and the, res you know, and less public funding um, available in early childhood. Um, it is also true that within this conversation of early childhood, the younger the child, the less the public investment. Um, in Oregon, when I had the uh, privilege of working for Governor Brown, um, and I think my colleague Sarah is here, and she'll, I think she made this chart. Um, we showed that you know we took Oregon's investments, and we showed that you know we put a chart. This is, this is the science of this is brain development, right? From and so you can imagine the chart is brain development to adulthood, later childhood, and these are our public investments. The absolute inverse to that, right? So it was, you know, that chart was the gift that kept on giving because we always had the governor going, and Miriam showed this chart, you know, and what are we gonna do about that? Um, so, you know, th so the, again, what do babies and families need? You know, we work towards outcomes of good health, positive early learning experiences, and strong families. Increasingly, with a, a structural uh, equity frame, uh, that means more explicit work on economic justice. Um, you know, and then the how, it's about removing barriers, looking at opportunity structures, thinking about how resources are distributed, um, you know, what mechanisms are in place to understand um, who's benefiting um, and who isn't, right, from the programs and services and the policies. Um, you know, again, keeping that clear eye on, on who's most impacted. And I think I'll, you know, I'll sum up and say that, you know, in the end, and I'm going to um, quote a, a former colleague of mine, um, you know, this all work to, to have ECD truly be justice work. This is all in service of, you know, a transformation and a change where a family, a be, you know, a family transitions from being a client to being a citizen. So great. I want to thank my panelists for their opening remarks that were right on time. I love that. Um, we're going to transition to the opening sort of conversational part of our session. And I'm going to start with our open-ended question. So the open-ended question, um, and let me frame it for you beforehand. So I talked about um, very specifically how seeds focus is um, very strength-based and asset-based, right? And we, we know what the problem is. We know that systematic racism, inequalities are the problem. But what I would love to hear from you all now is um, to talk about what you think the solution might be. And specifically, my question is, what do you believe are the next action steps um, we have to take in the early care and education field in order to dismantle these structural inequalities? So I'm going to um, leave that open, and each person can respond um, at will. I, I can start down with Leah if you want to go in a row. Sure. Um, I have a whole list of things, but um, I will prioritize them. I mean, I think the most obvious is resources, right? Um, you know, we, we need more money, and we have to break this link between what parents pay and what is in the, in the system to pay teachers and um, providers and just our workforce as a whole and provide resources. Um, but in doing that, in providing more resources, we also have to have the structures and policies to dismantle, to do what um, the charge of uh, you know, this panel is to discuss and what Phil you raised about dismantling inequities. Our policies have to, to be designed to do that, right? If we put more money into the system and don't change our policies, we're moving the, the needle, but we're keeping those inequalities in, in inequities in place. So we really need targeted, um, targeted policies, targeted resources so that we're really reaching those who are most oppressed um, and who are furthest from opportunity and, sh and ensuring that um, they have what they need to thrive, whether we're talking about children, their families, um, their educators, right? All of those are, are connected together. So really having those, those targeted anti-racist policies that are um, uh, breaking up the system and interrupting um, the inequities that we see today. And the other thing I want to mention is data, um, which was uh, mentioned today. And Dean Schwartz talked about the need for data. Um, this is certainly true across um, the early care and education space and for the workforce. We have to be able to understand where our inequities are so that we can address them, we can course correct when we don't have data, both quantitative and narrative, 
data um, that is masking the inequities that exist. It's masking the harm that we know people are experiencing. So we have to have good data um, in many different forms so that we can, um, we can, we can know what, what's in our system, right? And I think one thing that we don't think about is we can have a policy that seems to be working for you know, children in some way. You know, it provides access and that's seen as a success. But if we're not looking at all of the other parts that touch that access and what's happening to the workforce, for example, um, there may be something in that policy that's actually harming somebody else at the same time. And so we, we have to make sure our policies are coming at this from a child, a family, and a workforce perspective. Yeah, awesome. What do you think? Oh. Uh, go ahead. <laughs> Um, well, I mostly am just a plus one to what Leah just said. Um, I would say I think the first most important step is that we start with a different set of assumptions and that we can start with an assumption that says, that asserts that, um, that parents make good decisions and that what they choose for themselves and their family reflects their needs and their values. And we can also start from a, a, an assertion that um, providers are committed, creative, entrepreneurial, and capable. Mm -hmm. And that as we design supports and changes and shifts in our system, those are two sort of places that I think we have to start. Um, to my mind, the real opportunity is to address economic well-being as a condition for child success, not as a result, <laughs> you know, um, for children. And so I think, you know, it's not, um, it's, it's pretty straightforward, I think, to address the economic well-being of families and of caregivers. Um, I think we've seen success with the child tax credit as a way to get some of that economic uh, support to families. And I think we have a long way to go to get predictable, stable, and sufficient economic resources to our child care providers of all sorts. On top of that basis and that foundation of a full belly and not worrying about paying for rent, we can do incredible things that, you know, where we innovate around curriculum and assessment and, uh, you know, all kinds of things. I don't think any of that will be successful if we continue to put it on the shoulders and on the backs of burdened black and brown women who are holding our families as our society leaves them. You know, I think I agree, yes, plus plus level up, <laughs> all that's been said so far. I mean, I think the, you know, the only things that I would um, probably add to this is that, um, you know, we uh, really to, to get this done, to act, to, to what are the action steps, I think we need to think a lot more about who has power, how are we shifting power, um, you know, we have an election coming up next week, who's been able to exercise their voice and their power. Um, the policies that we're talking about are broadly popular, right? The child tax credit, affordable child care, health care. We want this for each other, right? We want this for babies. We want this for families. Um, and what, you know, what is happening right now that, um, you know, we, we, that this is so elusive. We came so close within one vote um, in the U.S. Senate last year to be able to, in one piece of legislation at the federal level, which would not have solved everything, obviously, but to, to, and in, to make permanent and enhance refundable child tax credit, affordable child care, universal preschool, a whole host of policies in the healthcare system, right, that would have driven towards healthy birth outcomes. Um, and, and we lost it. And I am hopeful it is going to come again, but it is not going to come um, without some real, um, some very big changes um, in who has power um, and who our policymakers and elected leaders feel that they are ultimately accountable to. I would add to everyone's agreement here that it's important to also acknowledge the humanity of care providers out there. They're not just units of supervision, which they are often framed as um, in the industry. They are real people with mental health dimensions. They have needs that are unmet and met. There are social interactions that happen within that early learning space that means a lot to what that environment can produce. 
for the next generation. And unfortunately, um, the ways in which providers are expected to be just points of supervision misses out on how their mental health wellness implicates the quality of services and the quality of responsivity, for example, they might manifest in their actions within the early learning space. Those are not non-issues, but yet they are from a regulatory level. Health and safety reign supreme in that context, but that's just one aspect of what is important. So I would also argue that it's essential for us to think carefully about how the ways in which traumas enter a population have to be treated as deliberate pieces of data to enact upon rather than just happenstance. Um, this is unfortunately the ways in which populations are held into the cycle of violence where underinvestment, because of it being a non-issue, perpetuates the crib to prison pipeline. Even with the likes of a Head Start entering those communities, because of how underinvested those mechanisms are, and how even the framework in which how children need support are, are just hyper-focused on that single element of a Head Start being a cure-all, misses the mark on how other elements of a society need to be intentional about how their actions implicate the next generation's wellness. That's a hard sell from a governmental perspective because even as it pertains to what it means to have cost savings as a function of, let's say, preventive services from a behavioral health context, those savings aren't born onto the health system. The educational system receives a lot of that benefit, but they're separate. Mm -hmm. They don't work together. And I think this is an opportunity for growth. This is so, I'm th I thank you all for these insightful comments, for bringing forth your unique expertise, as well as answering this question about what are our next steps, what do we do? I think that we have um, a small amount of time for um, at least one um, question from the audience to our panelists. So I would love to open up the floor to see if there's anyone who um, has any questions for our panelists here. So make yourself known and stand up and be big because I left my glasses at that podium. So, <laughs> so you need to make yourself obvious to me. Okay. Well, I also, anyone? Ah, I see you, please. Can we get a mic? that um, I'm just thankful for this opportunity. But my question is, I think the majority of the people in this room and maybe those who are listening via stream understand the importance. How do we get the message to our legislators and those who are in power that, that they need to change and shift their thinking to be more about the will of the people and the needs of the people and not just party affiliation? That's a great question. Well, from a funder perspective, I would say we need to make more investments in community coalitions so that they have the equity to be a part of those conversations, period. It's not a given that any community's voice ever enters the halls of policymakers. And so from my perspective as a funder, it is critical that we invest heavily in community work yeah. And so, so as to elevate that voice into those formative spaces where decisions and policies are made. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for that uh, really great question. Um, well, you know, I'll go back to Tuesday. <laughs> That's a first um, and really important opportunity, right, um, in terms of uh, how we show up, how we talk about, um, you know, who we support in terms of, you know, these issues. Some of these issues really have historically not been, you know, red, blue, right? They've been bipartisan. Um, there's support for them. Um, that said, we are in such a polarized time, right? It's like, how do we, um, how do we show up and get back to that and, and vote on that and make sure that we know that? Um, I say that and know that not everybody will have that privilege and opportunity on Tuesday. 
And again, there are structural, uh, you know, there are very intentional forces at play that, that are making that so not everybody gets that voice. And so sometimes, um, you know, again, I think I've been in moments when I thought, okay, how am I working at the structural level? Okay, I'm going to go work on voting, <laughs> you know. Um, so, but again, I think that just punctuates the point of like when we're talking about ECD and we're talking about it as justice, we're thinking about all these issues, you know. Uh, I'll echo what um, uh, Calvin said as funders. Each one of us has to be explicitly focused on that and using whatever power that we have to be able to get, um, you know, the, create opportunities um, for those who, for whom these systems and policies work the least well or the communities that are most marginalized to be able to get in front of policymakers. So, you know, I think a lot um, for me about creating institutions, you know, leaders are critical, but institutions build power. So how do we build more institutions? So what Kelvin's talking about, how do we build up community organizations? How do, you know, we think about all of those organizations having ECD in all of their policies and being able to see that as a, as a through line in their work. For me, at, at working, at a national level and for a national organization, it's like we're an institution with power, right? How do we get um, a seat at the table for families, for parents, for those in front of policymakers, right? Because um, because we have that ability. Um, that's you know what, what some of what sharing power is, and, and and support people in communities those most impacted as leaders. Um, it's uh, time and again. It's repeat. It's it's a long road. Um, it's it's telling stories. Um, it's um, building, I think, institutions and building leaders um, and that, again, that have anti-racism at the heart of this work um, and that see ECD as justice. And, you know, again, I'm hopeful, but it starts Tuesday. So. <laughs> well, I would love to just say thank you to our panelists um, and thank you to Phil and to Joan for having the insight to put us with our anti-racist, dismantling systematic inequalities viewpoint and passion at the front of this conference. So we hope that we have planted a seed here for continued conversations around these topics all throughout the day. And um, we, we thank you for, yes, <laughs> for being here.